By 2043, it is projected that America will be a nation majority of people of color, that minorities, Latinos, African Americans, Asian Americans, and Native Americans will make up 53% of the United States. White Americans will make up 47%. Now, we talk about that. Uh, we talk about that within the context of white fear, what's driving a lot of these white Americans. Who's going to have power? My next guest says, hmm, not so fast. Richard Alba has a book called The Great Demographic Illusion, Majority, Minority, and the Expanding American Mainstream. Richard, glad to have you here on Roland Martin Unfiltered. You're, well, you're, I'm you're, glad to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Well, I and, appreciate uh, it. Your thesis is that people need to understand that the assimilation, the mixing uh, of folks, the increase in interracial marriages, uh, all of this is going to throw off this notion of majority minority by 2043, correct? Absolutely. So think of it in this way, that the majority minority idea is really a kind of a binary conception imposed on the American population. You're either white or you're a person of color. Well, increasingly, there are large numbers of young people who are in between because they are the products of a white parent, a family with a white parent and a family with a non-white parent. And we know that um, these young people have very fluid identities, meaning sometimes they think of themselves as mixed, sometimes they think of themselves as minority, sometimes they think of themselves as white. And so therefore these predictions are very hard to um, see as credible. One of the things that, that, that I have also said that we have to understand is, and I remember, I remember this came about uh, about, I guess it was like 2012, white Hispanics. I remember being on a call in CNN that was one of the executives of this big debate and one executive said, there's no such thing as white Hispanics. And I start laughing. And then that was someone on the call who said, um, you're wrong, I'm white Hispanic. And this white executive was absolutely shocked. And the reason I was laughing, I'm born and raised in Texas. I grew up with white Hispanics. So part right. of this yeah. thing as well is there are people who identify as Hispanic or Latino, but they come to America, they identify as white as opposed to brown. Well, that's absolutely true. And I mean, we see this very clearly in the census data that more than half of Latinos on the race question identify themselves as white. Now, there are a number of different reasons why that might happen, um, but certainly the mixing of Hispanics with Anglo whites um, is an important part of that. So today, one out of every five children with a Hispanic parent has a non-Hispanic white parent. And that mixing has, in the Hispanic case, has been going on for decades. And, and, and what that means as well uh, is that, and, and this is the thing that, that, that we've always talked about, and this is why you've also had the tension that exists, um, especially among a lot, for a lot of African Americans. Yeah. African Americans fighting for equity, fighting for rights, fighting to use our numbers when it comes to power, who's the police chief, who's the fire chief, who's, on the, who's the school superintendent, uh, the, the, you know, sp uh, you know t t spoils of the victors. And then you have Latino slash Hispanics who come in and like, oh, you know, now you know, we're, we're the dominant number. And black people are like, hey, what the hell's going on? And then you have this battle going on where you have people uh, who are Latino who get to, frankly, have best of both worlds. Oh, you get to identify as white but still say I'm a minority. And, and, and this, this tension is real. This tension uh, uh, yeah. is, and, and also, when we talk about this here, I even, because you heard me say Latino slash Hispanic, part of the problem there is, depending upon who you talk to, you've got your white Cubans, but you've got your Afro-Cubans. Both Cuban, but again, they, they think differently. Afro-Cubans tend to align themselves more with Dominicans. So when you go yeah. to New York, you have Dominican, Afro-Cubans aligning with African-Americans, you don't see these white Cubans aligning with African-Americans in Miami-Dade. 
Well, I think one of the most false ideas connected with the majority-minority thesis is that people of color are going to be a solidary political group who will really radically change the politics of the United States. These are very different groups, and they're all immensely diverse inside. I mean, Hispanics especially, so many different countries involved, a really great spectrum of racial appearance, um, and, and pretty high rates of marriage and mixing uh, with whites. And, and on that particular point there, uh, and again, being from Texas, I've really understood this. I've said to national media for the longest, you, ca you have to look at the nation differently. You have to look at the last election, 2020, significant number of Venezuelans and Cubans who voted for Republicans and Donald Trump. But then when you go to New York, New York, it's a whole different uh, Hispanic slash Latino vote. Then when you go to Texas, which would be different than what you see from Arizona, and Arizona, different from, from what you see from California. And then when you throw in the power of the Roman Catholic Church in that mix as well, uh, it's, it's a whole different dynamic. And then, of course, when you look at these numbers with, uh, with uh, Hispanic slash Latinos, how their view is, uh, even when it comes to immigration, Folks will say, well, man, you can't be, be a Hispanic Latino and, you know, you're riding Republicans with immigration and then you look at the numbers. And so all of this is, is, is again, it completely throws off what has been the tradition in America where everything has been very linear, and that is black, white. Correct. Binary. That's the problem. Thinking in terms of a binary. I th we shouldn't only pick on Latinos because it's also true that Asians have very high rates. Oh, of I, I was going there next. White. Go okay. ahead. Go okay. ahead. Okay. No, no, no. I think, you know, I think this is an important phenomenon and it's only growing in the, the young people coming from this, these mixed families. Every year, when I look at birth certificate data, the number of them is greater than it was in the prior year. So this is really an increasing pattern um, in American life, and it's going to have big implications for how we think about race and ethnicity by the time we're in the middle of the 20th century. Well, one of the things that black folks, though, are saying to Asian Americans and to Latinos and Hispanics is, I mean, black people are sitting here saying, um, y'all going to get y'all wake up moment. Just let us know when it happens. And we saw that in the last year. Uh, the dramatic increase uh, in uh, attacks against Asians, okay, which led, of course, uh, to uh, the bill being passed by Congress. Same yeah. thing we've seen uh, when it comes to Latinos, the whole battle over immigration and the language being used. Black folks are sitting here saying, we tried to tell you, look, we, we can't assimilate, okay? Now, very few of us can. There are black people who can pass for white. Look, my, my Aunt Rita, who's now deceased, uh, she passed for white. Uh, in fact, uh, her daughter did not even tell my grandmother until a month after her, uh, she died that she had passed away because she didn't want us coming to the funeral. Trust me, I still might show up at her daughter's house one day with my cameras uh, <laughs> saying, hey, cousin, how you doing? Yeah, uh, but the uh, point there is we can't assimilate. And so what's happening here for African-Americans, Richard, we're sitting here watching these things play out going, y'all need to understand you can try to be as white as you want to, but you are going to realize that you still are not white. Okay, so let me, let me suggest a different way of thinking about this. I, I fully take your point, but um, it may be that um, you don't really have to become fully white in order to be able to kind of participate in the, the mainstream society, to assimilate in that sense. And I think what we see with many of these mixed young people is that they do identify with their minority origins, but that doesn't hurt them as much as it perhaps hurts for, um, you know, African Americans who look very dark-skinned. Oh, it still hurts them, because, see, even they get their black moment. See, Richard, here's the whole deal. Here, and again, when I look at, I look at a hardcore, and when I look at d demographic numbers, I'm still looking at power. I'm looking that at power. money. Okay. I'm looking at right now, we're in this battle right now for media dollars for black-owned media companies. Black-owned media companies getting 1% of contracts. Latinos getting 2 and 3%. And so, so we're, we're actually seeing that. We're experiencing it. Same yeah. thing is happening so many other levels. Uh, and so, that, so, so the thing, the battle that is going on really is, okay, sure, 
folks are marrying one another. Sure, you're seeing an increase in, uh, in uh, interracial marriages. But the question is, from a policy standpoint, how are people identifying? And the reality is there are people who identify with whiteness in terms of how they look at, again, political decisions and how they impact people. That's where I think this thing uh, is, is, is really uh, murky. And the challenge is, all right, you may say, hey, I'm biracial, but are you, you still are going to be in a situation where are you advancing, again, based upon your right. resume, based upon yeah, the man. content of your character, as opposed to a racial dynamic that's, that we understand is still at play? Okay, so one thing that needs to be pointed out, and I don't want to gloss over the points you're making. Go and, ahead. And say the, but the, if you look at the top of the U.S. workforce, it's becoming much more diverse. There's yeah. a huge change taking place because guess what? There are not enough qualified whites to fill the positions that are opening up at the top of the workforce. So increasingly we have people of color, people from mixed backgrounds rising to those positions. Now, are they being treated entirely fairly? I don't know. I don't know. But the, but I think the power structures are starting to change. Now, I've, you've been talking a lot. I've been watching your show and enjoying it very much. And you've been talking a lot about, you know, the Republicans uh, basically uh, retreating to a white, a white base. And that is an, a real phenomenon. Absolutely. But I think um, we shouldn't take it for granted that the fact that there are more people of color means that, therefore, that power dynamic is going to shift in the Democrats' favor. Well, I, I it, well, it, well, yes and no, which is one yeah. of the reasons why the Republicans had a, 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 a clear focus controlling the courts, which is why, by again, the kind of people they put on, Mitch McConnell was very clear. They wanted to appoint people who were 35 to 45. Uh, they appointed no black appellate judge. I mean, Donald Trump... I think the number was five or six black judges total. I mean, so they they basically were appointing white folks. They were appointing Absolutely. young white yeah. people yeah. who yeah. they yeah. wanted to be on the courts for the next 30, 40, and 50 years. I'll bring my panel in here for questions for you as well. Uh, sure. The, the, thing, the thing I do want to ask you, though, uh, is, is that when you when you were doing this here, it's one, it's one thing to look at the numbers just from a demographic standpoint. Of course. It's another yes. thing to then look at how folks are falling when it comes to, uh, you know, on, uh, you know, on these issues, uh, and, and and what we also are seeing, uh, especially when you begin to look at abortion, when you look at immigration, when you look at again these hot button issues. Um, what did you discover in terms of how this browning of America, how that is playing out on those? culture wars or right. those okay. core well, issues for the yeah. GOP in Democrats. Okay, so, um, so one thing that I think is a useful kind of data about how people perceive things is uh, Ian Haney Lopez, who's a Berkeley law professor and very famous in the critical race literature for a great book called White by Law, did some interviews with Hispanics before the 2020 election to see how they were perceiving the issues and the candidates. To his great surprise, the majority of the Hispanics that he interviewed did not identify as people of color. They identified either um, as similar to the European immigrant groups, or they thought of themselves as he called them bootstrappers, people who by their own efforts were making it into the mainstream of American society. So. Think about that. That suggests really a very different um, political outlook for a lot of Latinos in the United States. But you know what, though? Here's the deal, though. I'll be honest with you. I understand why. Because the reality is this here. If I came to America and saw how black folks are being treated, I'm like, man, I am not trying to be anywhere near them. And see, even, the, even that language, even the because we, we see it even within... Uh, within the black culture, uh, you saw a significant number of uh, black immigrants who were supportive yes. of Donald Trump. Yeah. The Republican <laughs> Party loves to go pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And folks like, yeah, that appeals to me. And we're sitting here going, 
Hell, they didn't pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. They got what they got because of government handouts, uh, the Homestead Act, uh, and the uh, GI Bill as well. But again, the rhetoric is what is appealing to them, and so they're able. To, Republicans are able to speak that language. Uh, but in reality, I'm sitting there going, "That's a hangout." Elon Musk is only a billionaire because he got tax incentives, not because he's this brilliant person. Yeah. But again... I'm not, I, I'm not challenging what you're saying at all. I mean, I understand your point. You're, it's valid. But it's still, we need to understand how people see their place yes. in the society and what kind of politics comes out of that perception. And that's where the majority-minority thesis really falls down. Questions for our panel, Julian Malvo. I start with you. Question for Richard Alba. Uh, Richard Alba, first of all, congratulations on your book. I look forward to reading it. I think it will inform some of my work here at Cal State LA uh, in the College of Ethnic Studies. I want to talk to you about anti-blackness um, okay. because what we what we know is that you've got this ethnic continuum, uh, African American. Latino, Latinx, Chicano X, Asian American, they're not all the same. And as you mentioned, uh, there is a fair amount of uh, intermarriage and mixed folks, and that's, that's on the rise. But the anti-blackness seems to be at the core of the American identity. Uh, we see it almost everywhere. And no yeah. matter how you we uh, dilute the majority-minority theory, the core anti-blackness stays there. What does your work and what do we say about this anti-blackness and is there a cure for it or must we continue the struggle as my colleagues and I have talked about through yeah. this entire program because of anti-blackness? Okay. Well, so I think that um, out of my thinking and work comes the idea that the immigrant experience, even when we're talking about people of color, is very different from the African-American experience. And that the Afri African-Americans have faced racist barriers that have no equivalent for people of color who, who, who are the products of immigration. And in the book, I argue that, um, that the country needs to confront the reparations question and to recognize that um, African Americans are going to need special help to overcome the barriers that have been placed in their way. I'm sorry that it's not a more hopeful message, but that is what I think is true. Uh, Toron, your question for Richard Alba. Uh, Mr. Alba, um, my question is, um, using some of the things you mentioned in your book and some of the um, phenomenon about um, immigrants and people of color and their attitudes towards African Americans, do you think that there's a resistance to having a conversation about the special circumstances that African Americans are dealing with because they're people who are coming into this country trying to assimilate with what they see as whiteness and they don't really want to have that conversation? I, you know, first of all, the book did not deal with anti-blackness, so I can't really say that I understand or know kind of what level of anti-blackness there might be among other uh, minorities in, in the United States. It's my hope that a different way of telling the American narrative, not the majority-minority story, which is divisive, and as we know, on the right has given rise, you know, to things like replacement theory, which is being used to gin up uh, white anxiety and white support for the Republican Party. But that a more a more a, a narrative that allows everyone to buy in to some extent will create room for African Americans too uh, to move up in the way that Latinos and Asians seem to be doing. All right, uh, Avis, your question for Richard Alba. Yeah, I, I'm really intrigued with uh, the direction of your book, as you've laid out here, because I, for a while, have, you know, questioned uh, the Democratic approach towards the Latino vote based largely, quite frankly, on some of the things that you're pointing out here. Uh, you know, I, I don't understand why people are so shocked to see such a large proportion of uh, the Latino vote supporting Republicans, even in a Trump era. Uh, if they were to sort of take into consideration what you're saying here. Uh, I would argue if you specifically look at Cubans, for example, and others who, as you mentioned, have 
uh, a more light appearance, uh, I would argue that there is a, 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 a predisposition to identify as white and to, you know, therefore be more likely uh, to have these political leanings. Given, given mm -hmm. that, um, what do you think about uh, sort of the strategy of a Democratic Party, which to me, it seems as if uh, they continue to invest in a Latino community to the extent in which it sounds like to me they almost are expecting uh, to win a, a, a proportion of the Latino vote that is more commiserate to the proportion that they receive in the African American vote, uh, which I believe they get more bang for their vote, um, bang for their dollar, with regards to their black investments, with regards to voter turnout, uh, than they do with regards to their uh, Latino investments. When, it, when we speak to voter turnout, because they lose such a large proportion, up to a third or more, to the Republican Party. Uh, well, any thoughts about that? Well, I, I think, first of all, you're absolutely right about, about the, you know, the black support for the Democratic Party. And Georgia, of course, is the proof of the pudding that the Democrats um, have the control of the Senate is, is really thanks to the black African-American voters um, in Georgia. I, I think that um, the Democratic Party needs to, frankly, appeal also more to whites, because whites, e even if everything about the majority-minority thesis is true, whites are still going to be the majority of voters in the middle of the 20th century. Um, and mm -hmm. so the, uh, we need more attention to class issues. I think on the Democratic side, in order to have greater appeal throughout the throughout uh, the white population. Currently, the Democrats are favored by highly educated whites, which are an important group, but it's hardly a majority. Well, but but Richard, but the reality is this here, uh, and that is no Democrat has won a majority of the white vote since LBJ in 1964, and that's because Correct. the Democratic yeah. Party chose to embrace civil rights. Uh, and the re and so the so the reality is, uh, you know, if Democrats get 42, 43, 45 percent of the white vote, hey, they, they, they're doing an amazing job. And so that's really on white voters. So Howard Dean actually had it had, had nailed it in 2004 when he said, "Hey, Republicans hit God gays guns." So it's not really about the policy. Like I, you had some broke white folks in Kentucky were saying, "Man, I, I, after Trump won, I hope I lose my Affordable Care Act." And I'm sitting there going, "But you idiots just voted for Trump and a Tea Party Republican who both campaigned on getting rid of the Affordable Care Act." Yeah, so right. part of the problem is that a lot of white voters in this country, especially those with no with, with no college degree. They actually have been voting against their own interests, which is yeah, part of the problem. Yeah, Last question yeah. for you, I'll ask you this here. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. And and I think that um, you know, so the Democrats won the presidency, and we're glad of, about that. But in the 2020 election, which was a high turnout election, which supposedly favors favors Democrats, they barely held on to Congress, even though you know the presidential their presidential candidate got seven million more votes than the other guy. But there's no shot. I think, I think we're a divided country. We need to look at every corner of the voting populace to figure out how to get more votes. Well, but actually, but the problem is actually not even getting more votes. The reason Democrats badly held on is because Republicans have controlled Southern states and legislatures. There are, there are 99 legislative bodies right now in America. Republicans control 61. They control 31 governor's mansions. And so they have, the problem has been gerrymandering. And guess what? John Roberts and the Supreme Court screwed that over when they said, mm -hmm. hey, we can't rule in political gerrymandering. We, we kick it back to the states. Well, here's the problem. They have gerrymandered the state Supreme Court. And so the Republicans have guaranteed themselves control, even right now, right now, because of the census, Republicans control the House and the Senate in Texas and Florida. In Texas and Florida alone, they could gerrymander themselves into the victory uh, in, in the House of Representatives. And so it's not, so if you look at the numbers, Democrats actually win more votes. They showed, but gerrymandering was so bad in Wisconsin that if Jim, Democrats won 55% of all votes in the state, they would still be in the minority in the legislature because they have gerrymandered the districts uh, so difficult. That's why the For the People Act is so well, important because well, uh, it deals with gerrymandering and setting up independent commissions to actually draw fair districts. Uh, the good point, good point. The last question I have for you, and I ask every author of this, is very simple. Uh, 
what was a wow moment for you when you were doing this book? What was that moment where you went, wow? Okay, the wow moment was when I realized just how um, high the number of people, young people from mixed backgrounds is becoming and that it's going to continue to increase in, in the future. This is a really the future of the United States in some ways is this is mixing. Right, which is which is what the one thing a whole bunch of folk, white folks in America feared, uh, feared this whole point, and it is changing. And it, but the, but the it thing, but the thing here that I'm looking at is, folks are mixing, but I'm still interested in terms of, are they looking? How are they looking at the issues? How are they sort of uh, breaking these things apart? And so, uh, 2022 and 2024, 2024 is going to be real interesting. And I keep making the point, Richard, that. This, this was not about Trump. It wasn't about the next eight years. We, this is going to be a battle for the next 50 to 100 years because yeah. race is still a major issue in the United States of America. There's no way of disputing that. That is clearly true. Folks, the book is called The Great Demographic Illusion, Majority, Minority, and the Expanding American Mainstream by Richard Alba. Richard, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Roland. Thanks Folks, very much for having me. Bye. Folks, back to our unfiltered video in just one moment. Racial injustice is a scourge on this nation, and the black community has felt it for generations. We have an obligation to do something about it. Whether it's canceling student debt, increasing the minimum wage, or investing in black-owned businesses, the black community deserves so much better. I'm Nina Turner, and I'm running for Congress to do something about it.